Last time on Hakai, with Goku chosen as the next god of destruction. Via a Grand Zeno overrule, as every single vote was actually cast for Vegeta, he would undergo a ritual to make it official. He then met the newborn Supreme Kai his life would be forever tied to. During all of this, he stumbled upon three statues, each representing a different destroyer of this universe. But how did this trio come to be? This story is created by Hakai and is part four of an ongoing series. Support him and catch up full using the links below. About 75 million years ago, one of the gatherings of the gods and angels of the 18 universes took place. Of course, six of which Zeno would eventually go on to erase. As all in attendance bow, the Grand Priest compliments everyone at this meeting. Like all the others, this was very productive. Before thanking them all again for their presence. And a humanoid lizardman pops his head up to state that he believes this is the perfect opportunity. He utters that he would like to proclaim that this is probably the last meeting he will be attending. Soon, he will be stepping down from his position as destroyer and passing the torch on to his apprentice, Beerus. Another reptilian-like person appears to take exception to this. But if we take a step back, we have Whis who we're already aware of, then the man who's just speaking, the current god of destruction of the seventh universe, Teron. Next to him, a young Beerus, then the supreme Kai of this realm, Gaza. Terran is named after a Spanish wine, and Gaza is just a name. Enjoy it. Though if we return to the disgruntled gent from before, he growls to know if Terran really intends to make a god out of this little brat. What a joke! This fine fellow is called Garoga, and his Kaioshin, Nua. Garoga could be a reference to a monster of the same name from the Zone Fighter series, though I'm not sure if it has an alcohol reference like many other destroyers. Though Nua is a Portuguese cider. The young Beerus hisses. What was that? Infuriated by the disrespect shown by the Universe 6 Destroyer. Before the situation can escalate any further, Terran steps in to defend his student. He argues that Beerus may be young, but make no mistake about it, he is indeed a promising successor, and he will soon make a powerful Hakai Shin. Groga sneers that this pathetic child has no potential. He will be nothing more than a failed god. The Dashinkan interjects to put a halt to this confrontation. He reminds his dear gods of destruction to mind their manners. Most of all, spare Grand Zeno this futile discussion. He's clearly uncomfortable with this interaction. As blank faced as ever, the Omni King emotionally utters that given this most recent nonsense, he thinks he's going to erase all their universes now. Immediately regaining the attention of the others, the Grand Priest chimes in to offer some advice, if he may, of course. He thinks they can give them a second chance before erasing their entire existence, especially considering that both Terran and Kaioshin Gaza of Universe 7 are deities who have demonstrated nothing but exemplary work. The God of All complies, but urges them to finish this meeting immediately. He finds all of this unbearably boring. Upon the request of Grand Zeno, the meeting was ended and all of the gods and angels returned to their respective universes. Universe 6, Planet of Destruction. <laughs> Sensing some disturbance with her destroyer, Kaioshin Nua asks what it is that bothers him. Who bellows, isn't it obvious? It's that darn Terran. He always keeps his cool and makes himself look superior. He wishes that apprentice of his would have come at him. That way he could have laid him out in front of Lord Zeno. But he always has to meddle. This is when Vado speaks up. She recommends that he must at long last put aside this silly rivalry with Mr. Terran. It's been almost 25 million years. But he screams he never will. He will never forgive him. But taking a hard left turn, Garoga detracts. He asks Vados if she could venture over to that planet Gaspa for him. He wants some of that delicious dragon meat. Whether cat or lizard, it seems like nothing can get in the way of a destroyer's appetite. The angel agrees to do so without resistance. She informs that she'll return in only a few minutes. The moment Vados is gone, Garoga hatches a plan. He beckons Nua to state that the two of them are the same. He doesn't like the Hakaishin of Universe 7, and she doesn't really like the Kaioshin of Universe 7, does she? With a stinging glare, she scowls that Gaza is always getting all the praise. No matter how hard she herself tries, he always seems to be one step ahead. 
Truth be told, she believes Gaza to be nothing more than a fraud. With this confirmation, the Destroyer gains the confidence to pitch an idea. How about the two of them implement some change for Teron? If they instill chaos into Universe 7, they can make them go from the envy of all to the laughingstock of the multiverse. She inquires just how they would go about doing that. If they act out against Universe 7 and someone finds out, they will surely be reported to Grand Zeno. Afterwards, there's little doubt in her mind they will be erased for committing such a crime, which is why they're going to act secretly. Nobody will know a thing. They're going to let the inhabitants of Universe 7 self-destruct. All they need to do is take some evil elements from the universe and let them wreak havoc instead of the two of them. The Supreme Kai finds this interesting to say the least. But still, if they go in there, it's very likely Gaza will at some point notice them. They will be reprimanded. Or again, even worse. Ibaroga has strategized for that too. Mockingly asking if only there were a region in the universe that not even the Grand Priest could gaze upon. She knows very well the land which she speaks though, doesn't she? But he couldn't mean. He does. Cutting away, we jump to a few days later to join Beerus and Terran on the Universe 7 Planet of Destruction. Upon delivering a devastating blow, Terran scolds that Beerus is nervous. He must compose himself. If he keeps attacking without thinking, he will only waste energy and leave gaps, such as the one he so blindingly exposed just now. The child screams he's had enough of his lectures. Charging up to use the Hakai, Teron is actually impressed. He didn't think his student was able to use this technique at such a level yet. While the blast would be deflected, Beerus was able to use it to get a clean uppercut on Terran, though it would simply be slapped to the surface below. As he goes to pick himself up, he turns his attention away from his master to bellow at somebody else, angrily asking what they want. Of course, none other than Whis. He snarkily, though fairly, questions if the fog in his mind has something to do with what happened at the meeting of the gods who transparently responds that he doesn't like that fool underestimating him. And he knows that it's not only Garoga that's the problem. All of the other gods see him in the exact same way and he's sick of it. After this outburst, Teron interrupts to quip that he didn't believe Beerus was still this weak. But what is he even saying? Beerus is the most powerful mortal in the seventh universe. What Teron means is, physically yes, Beerus' strength far surpasses all others there. But psychologically, he is still very weak. If an opponent said those same things to him during a battle, would it make him so nervous and rattled that Beerus would attack without even thinking? If so, that will make him a very easy target. If his apprentice here wants to be a god of destruction, he needs to not only strengthen his body, but also his rationality. However, the speech does nothing to change the child's emotions. He barks if he's kidding. He's never been able to use the Hakai at the level he just did. His anger made him stronger. It helped him progress. Though he's forgetting that the Hakai he just used is merely a copied version of the true energy of destruction. When he becomes a god and gets the real thing, just feeling angry will not help him control his powers. On the contrary, it will feed on his excess negative feelings and possess him. Still with an attitude, Beerus snips that he thought to master the Hakai, he just needed to think about destroying. And that jackass from the sixth universe makes that much pretty easy. His master inquires if it could be that he still doesn't understand, even after training all of these years. Destroying does not involve only feeling hate, but also understanding the cycle of the universe and the need for destruction to build something new and better. This is the essence of the work of a god of destruction. A destroyer needs, above all, balance. Reaching his breaking point, the child saunters off and mutters that he's sick of the small talk, beckoning Whis to take him home now. Teron motions for the angel to go ahead. In his current state, it's not like any training will really pay off. As the pair make their way back to the moral realm, 
Weiss asked a question Beerus if he's still sulking from what happened before. And how could he not be? He despises nothing more than being underestimated. The angel urges him not to take the actions of Garoga personally. In fact, his reason for picking on him has nothing to do with Beerus himself. It's actually all about Lord Teron. The truth is, the two of them have been great rivals for many, many generations. Asking if that's true, Weiss informs it is. It turns out that originally both of them were mortals from here in the seventh universe. Lord Teron and Lord Garoga's people belonged to neighboring planets, and as their planets were both scarce in natural resources, they sought each other's. That's how the two races became great enemies and fought fierce battles. They were the most powerful warriors among their armies. During one battle in particular, their people were completely decimated and only the two of them remained. Impressed with their strength, the Hakaishin at the time made the two his disciples and tried to make them understand each other, but it never worked. When the Hakaishin died, the two fought an immense battle to see who the next destroyer of Universe 7 would be. Garoga ended up losing. As Universe 6 also found itself in need of a Hakaishin, he was soon sent there. This all happened about 25 million years ago, but the feud between them continues to this day. Beerus figures that this must mean Garoga is just a repressed idiot after all. Either way, he promises to keep training and get stronger. One day, he'll overcome both Lord Teron and that darn Garoga himself. Which Whis is very glad to hear. They would shortly arrive at the planet Nikosi, a peaceful world. There are people... The Nekosegians have a very high power level compared to the average race of the universe. But despite this, they're very peaceful and spend most of their time in long slumbers. As a student makes his way across the surface, he can't help but notice as he flies over the planet's biggest city. Hardly anybody is walking the streets. It seems his people are just as lazy as ever. He actually envies them. Master Teron hardly allows him to sleep at all anymore. When an explosion breaks his focus from the metropolis and the city outskirts, it looks like someone has overcome their laziness today. He shouts out to the idiot below that he's going to destroy the entire planet if he keeps training like that. And down there, we find Champa. He mocks that unlike a certain privileged brat, he doesn't have a special planet to train on, or an angel, or a god to help him control himself. Prompting the apprentice to roll his eyes that he's still upset that he was taken and Champa wasn't. He needs to just accept it. But never! They both defeated that monster, but they only chose Beerus. Who reminds that when Whis and Teron arrived, Champa only wanted to enjoy the feast their people had prepared in celebration, and he only wanted to stuff his face instead of going with them. Now flustered, Champa claims he's just remembering it wrong. But while he's here, why doesn't he make himself useful and show him everything he's learned while away? Seemingly happy to oblige, he asks if he's sure he won't regret asking. A short time later, even Champa notices his brother's in a mood, questioning if something happened when he was away. And actually, yes, he's sick of being underrated all the time among the gods. He feels that none of them respect him, and even Lord Teron underestimates him. He wants to change that. Champa suggests that if they don't respect him, he should earn their respect. Simply show them how powerful he is. Which is easier said than done. How would he be able to prove it? Right on cue. The entire city is destroyed in an instant. Could this be the doing of Universe 6? Or is this simply a coincidence? Furious, Beerus screeches to know who's done this. Blasting away, Champ asks a holler for him to wait up. He's coming too. In tow, he asks his brother if he's also feeling this. Which of course he does. A very strange energy. It's completely evil. As the source of the chaos reveals itself, Beerus warns Champa to not let his guard down. They leer in in astonishment at the beast before him. Beerus yells if this creature thinks he's afraid of his ugly face. Watching on, Champa can't believe what he's seen. 
Beerus gets so powerful when he's serious. This doesn't even compare to their training from ever before. After sending the creature barreling into a crater, Beerus sparks what the monster thinks of that. That's for all of his people he killed. Regrouping, Champa asks if it's dead. And of course it is. Can he see? But as the smoke clears, it's hardly phase. Speed! Finally getting in on the action himself, Champa's able to free his brother from the grip of their enemy. Upon seeing if he's okay and asking what the heck this thing is, we can see that he's definitely taken some damage from that last assault. He doesn't know what this creature is, but it seems to have a particular affinity for Beerus himself. Champa chimes in that he's not sure how he's doing it, but it seems like he's getting stronger as the fight wears on. If they want to have a chance, they're going to have to fight together. Though even injured. Beerus can't help but scoff at the idea. He thinks he'd rather just get squished by this thing. When Champa cries that it's coming right at him! Diverting his attention, Beerus mocks it for him to come get him. With a little teamwork to get the monster suspended in the air, Beerus shouts for his brother to blast it now. Who insecurely argues he knows. He doesn't need to be told what to do. wait to see if their latest attempt works. It also did nothing. Champa bellows out that was his strongest attack. Beerus wonders if it must be that common attacks don't work on it. There's only one attack he can use. He didn't want to put the planet at risk since he hasn't mastered it yet. But he's not afraid. Damn monster! Did you think you could attack our people and not be punished? Out of nowhere, it seems some of the survivors from the city have come to join in on the battle. Though Beerus screams at him that they're no match and must flee now! As the beast goes on the offensive once more, the stranger turns to announce they will all attack at once! No! As the cavalry is vaporized, Champa alerts that that ball is heading towards the planet. If Beerus doesn't stop it, it'll destroy everything. Acting quick, he uses himself as a barrier to protect his world. As his brother tells him to take care of the blast, he'll fend off the monster. Unfortunately, these heroics are short-lived. Future Destroyer thinks to himself that he wanted to save this for the monster. But there's no other way. He's going to have to use the Hakai right here and now. While well, the attack is thwarted, Champa! all hope seems lost. As Champa bounces off the ground, he still clings to life. He mutters at their foe, still getting even stronger. Replicating its previous attack, it hurls it at the Necosegians. Beerus knows he spent almost the remainder of his energy on that Hakai. Even if he didn't and he was still at full power, this abomination is to the point where he's now surpassed him at his best. It looks like the end. When a voice calls out from overhead. Very well, Beerus. You've done a great job honoring the role of a disciple of a god of destruction. But this battle is suited only for a god of destruction himself! As Teron enters the battle to save his disciple and his planet, we're left wondering if this was indeed the doing of Garoga and Nua, or simply unfortunate timing. While we know what will eventually become of Beerus and Champa down the line, what will become of their planet?